raise the standard in some place that is only visible to you and watch what the fuck happens in your business. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Unstoppable Woman podcast. I am thrilled to be here today with one of my best friends in the entire world, business besties, um, like fills my heart and soul, human being, Jesse Johnson. And welcome, Jesse. Oh my God, I'm so excited for you to be here. (laughs) I'm so excited to be with you and I just got extra excited because this is the first time I'm seeing your little pup in real time and so I just like got really excited to like be with both of you. Yes, he's my little precious baby and he's sitting right there in the corner sound asleep. Hopefully he stays that way throughout the entire podcast. Uh, um, If not, we'll (laughs) we'll wing it. We'll work it out. (laughs) Yeah. So as context for everyone listening, Jesse Johnson and I both kind of grew up together in our businesses and have had very parallel uh, success stories and parallel growth uh, challenges, growth curves, whatever you want to call that. And it's been a beautiful journey to be on with you. Like it's just mm. been so great to have someone who, even though we were we were riffing before we got on on and live and recording about how, you know, even when we're not in immediate conversation with each other, returning each other's phone calls because things get rocking and rolling in business, right? And 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 sometimes we don't return calls. Like the love is still there, and it's like all good. And it feels so great to have someone in your life that you have that experience with. So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a woman in business and you are seeking that, I would put that on your vision board. I would place that Mm. in your imagination. I would hold that as a, like, this is happening. I'm calling this in right now because it's so essential for someone to have your back that you truly love, right? Yes. I love that you're saying that as I'm listening to you. I'm just aware that I think when we started our friendship, I was still, maybe you were too, but I for sure was still kind of referencing old paradigms for friendship. Yes. And in those old paradigms, there was a lot of, it's not the perfect word, but it's the best word I can come up with, like proving our loyalty by acting in certain ways, calling each other, no matter whether the callback was requested is an example of that. Like just this kind of social obligation. And I feel like we really went through some of that negotiation. Like, do we really want to have a friendship where that's the standard? Oh, actually maybe not. Like that's not, we want to do what's in service to both of us all the time. And that's, to me, that's the new paradigm. Is it's the new standard. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unstoppable women don't don't have to prove. It's and what like is, this is this is part of what we're standing for. I think that's absolutely 100% true. But tell me what that has allowed for you cuz I think that's important for people to see mm. cuz sometimes the sacrifice of the old ways, right? Like the the old obligations, like this is what friendship looks like. This is how a relationship looks like. It's deeply, in, it's deeply embedded. And yeah. when you let it go, sometimes it's, I know for me, it's been hard to let go of things without having the vision, the clear vision of what I'm calling in. I've, I've learned to step forward in trust and faith. And I, I know you have as, as well, mm. but what do you think it has allowed for you? Cause I think it could help paint a vision for people. Part of what's arising in me is that I'm thinking, I'm, that's a very living question for me. What, it, what, what the new standard creates is still very much unfolding for me personally. Um, and part of that, I think that's relevant also to share with your, your folks is that I really, when I, when I really committed to my business, I moved across the country and I really stopped participating in almost all my relationships. 
And I kind of got away with it because I just moved across country. So people were, were not checking for me in the same way that they had been. And so I got this kind of reprieve, but about, uh, we'd been here maybe two years and it started again. Like me feeling this, this like weighty obligation that had nothing to do with what anyone else was asking me for. It came from me and my program. So that you, you were a person who during that time entered my life and I felt the genuine desire not from obligation, from real desire to be closer to you, to cultivate a relationship with you. And so for that just, I want to emphasize that because that had not happened. Yeah, I think you were the first person that I really experienced that with. And it, it doesn't happen that often. There's not that many people I want to do this with. There's just not that many. There's way more people that uh, fit into the obligation paradigm than in the genuine desire paradigm. <laughs> Can you pause right there? Because that is so, so important. Okay, let's just pause. Because I, I know we speak the same language. I'm going to put it in, in my languaging, right. which is like, you're being called forward by desire instead of, you know, pushed or, or threatened by fear to do something. Mm. And that is, that is the big difference. I feel like that is what, when, when people talk about, when I talk about personal and professional freedom, like the amount of freedom that I feel right now, is it all perfect? Perfect. No. Okay. But the amount of freedom that I have right now comes from that distinction of yep. feeling comfortable, secure, confident to choose what I want, like the desire side and to let go of like, you know, that's like, I'm going to get bopped on the head, you know, boom. If, if I don't do what someone else his expectations are right and yeah. i'm i'm not available for that anymore there are things That's right. there's obviously things that you need to do in your business that require you to grow and become more and you know it's not the same thing but like that obligation piece i think that's such an important word that you pointed out yeah i well and i'm i'm really appreciating the opportunity to talk through this with you partly like because this is relevant in my life at this time, but also because you're the best person for me to talk about this with. So it's, it's, it's what I'm aware of now is that that initial desire to connect with you throughout our relationship, I, I feel we both have been in devotion to raising the standard that that's why we connect always. And so if it's not that, we don't do it. And so sometimes that means I call you and you don't call me back or you call me and I don't call you back. And we, I feel like we've been through the like, maybe even calling each other out of obligation. Like we, we've done the obligation thing, I think just a little in micro moments here and immediately one or both of us feels it. And we're just like, mm, okay, try again. Like <laughs> we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Yeah. And so I love what you're talking about, that it's not perfect because it, I, at least with us, I feel like it has been messy. And that's part of the commitment is that we'd and rather the, be messy than obligated. We'd correct. rather be free and support each other's freedom, even if it doesn't always, even if we don't always want the same thing or don't always, aren't always able to support each other in exactly the way that we want to be supported or something like that, that that's not, we are not in each other's lives to play a role. Correct. And adding to that hundred percent. Yes, you said it. Um, adding to that, there's, there's no, um, we're not going to make ourselves small and we're not going to come from a place of fear. Like I'm not like my love for you is so great. And I know that your love for me is so great that it, there's an unconditionality there to it, even though we're on a human plane and figuring out the messy parts of it. Like there is no fear there. I don't fear that Jesse is going to reject me, uh, cut me out of her life, be mad at me in a way that is um, at, at all negating who I am. Mm. She's allowed to have her feelings, her expression, all of that. But there's no threat there. Mm. And that is such an important piece, right? Good thing we're talking about this. Yeah. Let's, mm. let's now bring it to business. Okay. Because yes. so many people listen from a business perspective. Now let's co connect the dots because I, this is super important. So I, I want you at some point 
as you're answering my questions to contextualize your work in this world and tell people sure. what you do. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it's fantastic and kick ass. So this has been such a big deal for me. This concept has been such a big deal for me in my business, right? How I've shown up with clients, how I've shown up with potential clients in sales calls. So I'm just going to say it for you and you can add to it. But Jessie teaches sales as a spiritual practice. That is her, her lane. And it's a big effing deal because if you want to know how to move money, you have to learn sales. Okay. It's something I teach too, but she's got this really dialed in lane on it, which I love. And I think that that place of not coming from fear, not feeling that you're going to be annihilated, rejected, um, at, at all made small in this world is such a critical piece to showing up powerfully in your business. Can you speak yes. to that? It, I'm aware of both as, as I'm listening to you, both meaning the, like, let's just be clear in sales conversations, you will be rejected on a regular basis. But what you're talking about is not internalizing that, not taking it personally, being free to have your own experience of yourself regardless of what someone else is doing or saying. And I think about when I first started my business, being on sales conversations with people that I barely knew or didn't know at all, if they said no to me, I was crushed. Like I felt flattened, like I didn't exist anymore. I was worthless. I took it so hard because that was my emotional training up until that point. And I really did, and it was because it was so extreme that I was motivated to work on it because I was like, okay, this is unacceptable. Like, I don't know, how am I giving my power so completely to this person that like, when I am objective, it doesn't really matter what they say or do. So it's that, it's like freedom from the hook of whatever someone else is feeling, good, bad, otherwise. It's like, they get to have their feelings and, and I get to have mine specifically about myself, specifically about my life, specifically about my choices. But the other piece that I want to emphasize is that if I don't have standards around who I hang with and how we make our relationship in my personal life, then that is leaking into my business life. And I, I think this is actually the cornerstone. You're the perfect person to talk about this. You talk about this a lot. The, the personal relationships and the way that we show up in them deter, like cap us off in our business. Completely. Over and over and over, I see that. Like when people get stuck, where do you wanna look? In their relationships, their partnerships, their friendships, their sex life, like wherever it is that they are most intimate, it's showing up there. 100% because, I mean, the old adage, the way you do one thing, the way you do everything, I didn't get that for so many years. I was like, what are they saying? No, I'm like this over here. And I'm like, no, you're like that everywhere. And one, <laughs> of, the, one of the things that I did, and this is just a, a tip, a tool, is I was, I was realizing that I wasn't holding myself to the standard in my private life, in the privacy of my own world where no one was watching, mm -hmm. whether it was in relationship with someone else or just with me by myself, I wasn't holding myself mm -hmm. to a high, high standard. And that was causing me to see me, myself with lower worth because I knew I was not in integrity with my standards. And how could I be saying, you know, wanting to be one way with my clients, my potential clients, my colleagues, my business partners, you know, referral partners, whatever. And inside, I wasn't in integrity mm. with myself in my personal life. So I started cleaning up, like, who, do, who am I being when nobody's watching? Who am I being when I'm brushing my teeth? Who am I being when I'm going to the bathroom? Who am I being mm. when I'm putting on my makeup, when I'm putting on my clothes? Who am I being when I'm driving my car? Okay. And I keep, I iterate on that. It's not a one-time deal. Like mm. I noticed the other day, I've been really working on being on time. I, I did this whole thing with my team. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm I saw that. You're <laughs> paying everybody if you were late. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. It only happened twice. But I told everyone, if, if I'm late to a meeting, everyone at, that I have that meeting with, so if there's six people on the meeting, they all get this, they get $100. 
Now, the way this this works generally is like you're supposed to give $100 to a charity that you don't believe in. And so it's like an anti thing. Um, but I was like, I'd rather give the money to my team. Like I still, I have like some accountability there. Um, mm-hmm. And it only happened twice. And Sarah bought a new pair of shoes. She's like, um, but anyways, I, I st- so I cleaned that up. It hasn't happened again. All good there. But I'm noticing that my, when I have appointments outside of my house, I'm always rushing. Yeah. And I was like, this is, I'm out of integrity here. Like I have time mm. scarcity. This is a scarcity mentality. I actually have time to prepare myself and to leave in advance. And that means that I don't have to be a dick at the stop sign. I can like, I can stop. I can let that person walk <laughs> across the street. I can like let the four away. Like I don't mm. have to be like rushing. And I know that seems like such a simple thing, but no one's in that car with me. No one's watching me. That person at the intersection doesn't know who I am. Like there's nothing there, right? Like there's no, there's no cop there, but I know, I know that I'm not treating other people at the standard that I want to treat other people. So then I clean it up. Anyways, that, yep. that's a little mini example. It's so powerful. I, as I'm listening to you, I'm just like, you're there. And you're like, you're telling yourself what will become your personal law, not necessarily in alignment with universal law. Like when, and so, I mean, I, I'm, I can yeah. talk about this clearly because I have done the same thing. So that, that time scarcity sends the message that there, to myself, to every cell in my body, I'm sending the message there's not enough or I'm not enough or I'm not good enough or something, something that then sets me up to be in that cellular body. When I go into a coaching call or a sales call, how am I supposed to be the impression of increase in that new context if I'm practicing a completely different con- um, story in the other context? So I, it, this, I think that this is not only one of the most potent and powerful things that happens, this is the thing that like anyone who's wanting to grow could use to quantum leap in their business. Like you wanna try to change your, how much money you're making, Yes, of course, make sales calls. Like if you're not making sales calls, it's not going to work. But, but like do the kind of thing that Amir is talking about. Raise the standard in some place that is only visible to you and watch what the fuck happens in your business. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's who you're being. Okay. And you can't fake who you're being. Okay. Mm -hmm which is all like, that's an underhanded pitch that just came out of my mouth that I didn't re- like pre-plan. So, uh-huh. um, <laughs> so Jesse, I happen to know is, is she has a event coming up. That's like, you can't, what is it called? You can't fake it. Don't fake it. Don't what, what it's is it called, called? Fuck faking it. Fuck faking it. Okay. Yeah. Love it. I was like, <laughs> yeah, because it matters who you're being. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and if, if you don't like who you're mm. being, if you're out of integrity with who you're being, you cannot show up powerfully in this world. And, and can you talk a little bit about how that's an iterative process? Because I think what happens is people see the after story, but I had to go through a lot of iterations. And I just told you an example that's current right now. I'm still yeah. iterating on this. It doesn't stop. So that's can right. you speak to that a little bit? I mean, what's cool about the, the fuck faking it, like that, that context, that teaching has emerged since COVID. It, for me, like I, I was learning it from my mentors. So it's not like it's a new concept. I certainly don't own the concept, but I have become exponentially more unapologetic about who I actually am since the pandemic started. And I Let's think pause that a there lot for of, some, for, yeah, yeah. Why is that? Why do you think that is? I think that there's a few things going on. One is that it, it, my sense is that if we, if we look at an esoteric level at a mystical level, it, it, feels like that is the transmission of this time. Like the planet was so out of whack, so out of integrity, so out of alignment that, that some cosmic force was like, 
like we're going to interrupt all normal behaviors. Yeah. Try again. Um, so there's a collective thing that's happening. A lot of people are looking at their lives and pausing to reflect in a way that they didn't have time to before. So I think there's the energy of that was certainly contributing to my awareness. I think also (laughs) I was, I was still socializing, traveling and making decisions in my business a little bit or a lot connected to these old patterns of obligation. So that and, was the faking it. Like you, yeah. you were having to show up as someone else in obligation to these, the, this old way of being almost and not just other that's people. Right. Okay. Without, without having any awareness that I was doing it. And I think mm-hmm. that that's important to understand because in March of 2020, I was very, very advanced. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like I would say one of the most masterful people, one of the most aware people, one of the most self-reflective people, like, it's not like I was a baby at this in March, but March hit and I got an, a like 180 night and day level wake up call. Like, oh, I like to be alone a lot more than I am currently spending time alone. I, I like love to being spend alone. time. Oh my, like. <laughs> Like I knew that before, I would have told you that before, but like, was I acting it? Was I actually making that time? Like, no, I don't actually want to touch people that much. Very select people I enjoy touching, but like not being allowed to hug people has been kind of an amazing relief. Interesting. Like, yeah, let's, let, let me take my time to feel into whether or not I want to do that. Like little stuff, little stuff. I love to travel. I'll be honest. I miss traveling, but I also love to nest and I have not been nesting. I have not been building a home until now. Yeah. For How's married since life? Since I started my business. Married life is fantastic. I am totally married to and living with the person I most like to spend time with. It's very convenient. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm so happy about that. So talk to me a little bit about um, your, su- your success trajectory. So we're looking at this right now, but can you, can you go back a yeah. few years? And cause I think it's super helpful, helpful for people to see, okay, this is where I was at when I started this phase of the journey. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you know, you weren't, you were a very spiritual person at that point. It wasn't like yeah. you, you weren't, but can you tell us that context and then what has led to your success what, what key pieces you think have led to your success and kind of share that story? Yeah. I, I was a school teacher in New York City and then a coach to school teachers. That was my professional lineage, you could say. And I was real good. I was used to being excellent. I was used to kind of being top of the class, top of the, top of the, top of the. And, and teaching school and coaching teachers, despite it being in a school context, was not a place where I was seeing evidence of that. This feels actually like true confession. I've never said this to anybody before. My, my sort of valedictorian by, like, organism was unsatisfied by my lack of visible impact. So I, I think that that's, there's something in there that's important that I think you and I share, this kind of knowing that we can be great. Like we have been great, we can be great. And so when we're not seeing our greatness, it's like, what the fuck is going on here? Totally. Like it stands out. And it's frustrating. Um, it's it's yes. like, it, it feels, <laughs> it's such a trap. And, and, and all you know is that you keep hitting a wall. Like you, you're, you, it, for me, at least it was like, mm. I was going in circles. I was hitting a wall. I had a great attitude. I was thinking life's not so bad. Things are going well. Like I put a positive spin on things, but I wasn't stepping into my greatness and I yep. could feel that. Okay. Yep. Back to you. Well, and as I'm, I'm listening to you reflect so helpful. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, of course, because the greatness and anyone who's had this, I think you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. The, there's, there's two sides of that coin. There's like the, the, the thrill of being so great and being seen as great. And then there's also the contrast of being just like separated from people, 
people being like jealous or putting you on a pedestal or like it, the kind of downside of being seen in your greatness. So I think that I had been pretty satisfied with school greatness, but, but career greatness was more complicated for me. And so I was, I was negotiating that. But about five years ago, negotiations were up. I was like, this is not enough for me. I know that I want more and I know that the world wants more from me. And I hired my first coach without even really knowing that I was going to start a business. Like that was, I hadn't figured out what the next thing was. I just knew that there had to be a next thing and that I trusted this person to help me. I trusted her with my life, literally. So I want to emphasize that because that is definitely the key to my success that I knew that both parts, I knew I wanted more and that more was here for me. Same, same. And I also knew that I needed help and I was willing to say yes to a teacher to, to give me instruction to figure out what was next. So for me, like that's desire calling you forward. Like that's the want Wait, We both know how powerful that is. And you stepped into some deep knowing around it, which, which I think many people, you and I have this in common because we both had the same experience. We, we, language it differently but yeah most people feel my experience is most people feel that desire and then deny it for some reason they push it away mm -hmm. they say it, it, it's wrong they can't do it they don't take that next step which is a step of stepping forward in faith quite frankly the the, the belief in the unseen the thing that you don't know that the, there isn't a certain path but you know on some deep level that this is the way that's faith and I don't, I don't say faith in a religious context. I say faith in a, in a, um, well, it's a spiritual context, but just yep. in a concept. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a real powerful thing for people to recognize that that stepping forward, that yes, that we talk about that quick decision, that going forward, following your intuition, there was a knowing for, for Jesse that she did not deny. And she yep. was, it wasn't that, correct me if I'm wrong. I happen to know you pretty well. So I think I'm on the right track here, but correct me if I'm wrong, that it wasn't with, it, it wasn't fearless, but it was courageous. It was stepping forward mm -hmm. with cor courage, yeah. which is, doesn't mean that you weren't afraid. No, it was terrifying. Yeah. It's terrifying it was, for me too. It is yeah. terrifying. Yeah. That's, I think that that's the mark of, of exponential growth or quantum growth or even I would say spiritual growth, because I think spiritual growth by its nature is exponential. We're, we're tapping into something totally different energetically than, than the physical or the material. So yes, all of what you're saying, yes. Yeah. Faith, I think that what's interesting as I look on it now, you're right, I was, I was teaching meditation at the time. I had traveled to India. I was a very spiritual person. Almost all my social activities at the time were spiritual. Um, like organizing or participating in meditation, conscious parties where there was no alcohol or drug use and everyone was oming together, you know, like very almost to an extreme, you know? Um, and I really had a very close personal relationship with God and felt like my faith was very strong. And when I started my business, I was, I, th I both, I was aware that that faith and my spiritual practice up until that point was very sustaining. It was a, a fuel supply for me. And my business also showed me where my faith was not as unconditional as I thought it was. It was almost like in a spiritual context, I, I was good. But when it came to my physical life, I still was holding all the reins and not letting God in, not letting the the powers that are beyond this physical form collaborate with me. I think that's such a huge point, Jesse. Thank you for bringing that up because I haven't framed it in that way before, but it's so, it's so astute and smart because there's this way where we, we know something intellectually, but until we put it to the test, the rubber meets the road kind of thing, Mm. that is not faith. That's not understand. We both teach the universal law. It's not, it's, it, you can read the books, 
But mm-hmm. until you actually have something at stake and you must live it and you must step forward in faith mm-hmm. with belief, with trust, all of that, and you test it, you actually don't know it yet. Mm-hmm. That has been my experience at least, mm-hmm. you know? And, and my business has been that journey for me. I, I think you could do it in a relationship. I've done it in a relationship also, actually, now that I think about mm. it. But like, mm. Um, mm. It, it, the, yeah, the, the first phase was definitely the business. Yeah, there's something about, I mean, what I, what I have come to and still am pretty, pretty solidly focused on is money as a tool for deepening faith and spiritual practice and spiritual mastery. Another way of saying that is just consciousness, money as a tool for consciousness, because money is so much a part of our lives in 2020 and beyond, I'm sure. Um, and it, it, sh- it just, it's almost like a litmus test. It just shows us where we have a growth edge. Um, so to answer your question from before, I primarily work with spiritual teachers, healers, people who are in the business of transformation, particularly spiritual transformation. And often those people, it's changing. The, the, the kind of culture around spirituality is changing. But when I started just five years ago, there were very few spiritual teachers who understood money. And In fact, result- like, pause there. Because yeah. I remember the place in your business where you're like, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore, <laughs> right? Because like, talk to me about the the mindset that many spiritual healers and practitioners have around money and how like you you have to you have to educate them up for them to even believe that it's possible for them to to do to have it all really to it's do true. their spiritual practice and be a, a six to seven figure business owner right, That's right. i think that I, so much of it comes from cultural models. I, you know, I, I at least grew up in the eighties and really learned that you had to choose between wealth and integrity. That, that was the mental model that I was given that you could, you could totally, I, and I, I could totally make money, but in order to do so, I would have to give up either doing something that I love to do or doing something that was actually good for people. And I, I don't think I ever really considered doing something that wasn't good for people, but I gave up being an artist because I didn't think you could do both. Yeah. Like that was what I wanted to do. I wanted, I moved to New York city after college and I was ready to make experimental films that nobody had ever heard of or seen, you know, the Jackson right. Pollock of exper- 16 millimeter film. And very quickly both had the experience of not making a ton of money, not enough money to live, but yeah. also everyone in my community was like, yeah, you can't make money with that. So, okay. Oh, I guess not. I don't know any successful artists who are actually thriving financially. So I guess I have to do something that I don't totally love. Okay. I'll be a math teacher, you know? <laughs> which <laughs> makes was... so much money. Right? <laughs> Good pick, Jesse. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say, okay, I'll be a lawyer or okay. Right. Oh, no. Like, no, because, because again, because I had like, totally, I get it. The, the, I, this is really juicy, actually, like wealth, service and passion. I've never said those three things together, but those I did not see that I could do all three. Yeah. So, and it's such a lie. It is such, such a lie. Because look at this bitch now. <laughs> yeah, right on. Okay. And okay, so just as context, she went from math teacher to seven f- figure business owner and she's yeah, making I, her, her an impact. She's doing what she loves. She's doing her genius work. She's helping people, all of that. Okay. Yes. Fucking yes. kicking ass, taking names. Um, so a few more things on this. When you said that about everyone around you was saying it's not possible, no one does that. And everyone said you can't make money and like you didn't see anyone who was an artist making money you know, many of my clients are creatives and, and one of the first things that I do with them is I give them an assignment, go find rich artists because they Mm. exist. You Mm. just aren't seeing them. You're saying, oh, but that's not, 
the norm or that's not possible or that's the exception. I'm not going to look at it. But why not look at it and say, that's where I'm going. If she can do it, I can do it. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's convenient. I, I don't necessarily lead all of my conversations with I'm a spiritual teacher, but I'm a fucking spiritual teacher. That's what I am. I use sales and money as tools, as teaching tools. And I have a seven figure business, meaning that we make over a million dollars a year. That means that we make six figures or more every single month on average. In July, we had our biggest month yet during the pandemic at $241,000. Like that's three times as much or more as I made in a year before this business started. And I'm doing it as a spiritual teacher. So just my existence changes the, the nature of what people are talking about. I regularly have people come to me and say, I, don't, I didn't know that that was possible. I didn't know that you could do what you're doing and make money. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Well, so just me doing it is important. It's part of your changing. mission. And then, and then, of course, then empowering a bunch of other people to do it too. Because I think that the, the transformation that's ready, that the world is ready for right now, is our, not that we need to be saved, but it's our, it's our saving grace. Like that's, that's the next thing that people are hungry for. Yeah. That we're ready for. So our spiritual teachers need to be deeply empowered and deeply conscious. And if they go blind, if they go unconscious around money, then that's a problem. It's, it's interrupting their transmission. And there's something coming forward for me that I don't quite have the words for. Let me see if I can articulate it. Is there something in your experience with working with this clientele that has you knowing that there's something missing in their own spirituality if they have these blocks around money and sales? I mean, yes. Short answer, yes. Yes. I think that it's, it's a residual misunderstanding and also I think evolution. Like I think that maybe a hundred years ago when money was not quite so prevalent in our society, yeah, it was a different thing to choose to be a renunciate and not touch money. At this time in society, that's, that's still a totally legit, legitimate choice. My husband was a monk who renounced touching money for almost a decade. It's a very, very powerful experience. But unless you're that person, like unless you're gonna live in an ashram or a monastery and do that like full on, if you don't understand money, it's just a limitation. It's, it's just like, oh, I'm just not gonna learn how to write or read. Like the, it, for basic human contribution, you got to understand it. You got to have that. So I think that everyone negotiates this, but spiritual folks have that additional lineage really of spirituality having for a long time been separated from money. Um, and I, again, I think it's like, we need that. We, sometimes we really need to just go full on spiritual in order to tap that source and understand what it is. But most of us are not meant to stay there. We're meant to integrate. That's why we're here in these physical bodies because totally. we're meant to be spirit in form. And, mm. and money is our, it's like our final exam. <laughs> <laughs> Always the school teacher. It's your final exam. <laughs> oh, Chessie and I have that in common. Like I have the whole father as professor that's D work Amira, like step it up, right? Like uh -huh. this is all the psyche stuff that like how we see the world is fascinating, fascinating. So tell me a little bit about what you think your success has been based on because it, yeah, let me, let's, let's just leave it at that. What do you think? Cause, cause now you have the experience of working with many clients, some who have sailed forward and done extremely well and some who haven't quite frankly i as well right not all of yeah. my clients do extremely well i'd love for them all to but i i think that there are some th key things that lead to success so what yeah. are the things that you see that lead to success have led to success for yourself and for your clients how about that you know i have this whole framework that i teach about this 
And no surprise, what's coming through now is something different. So I'm going to give you the different thing. Okay. People can listen to my six step framework and read about it any, anytime, anywhere. We can give you the link. But what's coming through now is. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually about the willingness to dismantle the codependency that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Like to really be ruthless, relentless in my devotion to getting free around being, saying, and doing things that came from something other than that, that intuitive or divinely guided impulse. Yeah, that's so and spot on. That, that's continuous. Um, as you were saying, iterative. I love using that word in that context. I yeah. haven't done that before. Yeah. Um, I think that that's, that's been... On the surface, it was these six steps, like, you know, hiring a mentor and making the decision to change and creating a business that was designed to make money and then mastering sales. Like, I, I can't diminish or, or emphasize enough how significant that is. One of the main reasons, let's just be clear, one of the main reasons that I see people struggle is because they refuse to pick up the fucking phone. Yeah. Got to pick up the phone. But why? But right. why? Right. Because they have the codependency. So underneath that is this fear of breaking the role yeah. of being the good girl or the... I was recently at a summit with a bunch of powerful, powerful people. Powerful people. I mean, brilliant. And I was the only one who was willing to get up and say to everyone, like, if y'all are feeling called to do something with someone here and you haven't yet put some money down, you're not serious. Yeah. And all the other people that were speakers and panelists were like, <laughs> you know, like horrified or right. uncomfortable or odd. I don't know what their actual emotions were, but it was like, it's rare. It's rare yeah. that someone's willing to put their stake in the ground and say, but here's that thing again around the intersection between freedom and money right? You're actually speaking about money on stage, whatever, whatever the context of that was and saying, you know what, money is a tool, but you are attached to it in a, in a fear-based way. You're scared to invest because you don't trust yourself. That's not freedom. If you want freedom, if you want to have that, you have to take that first step. It doesn't come afterwards. It doesn't come magically. It comes mm -hmm. from stepping up and, and investing that's and right. breaking that codependency, right? On other people, who's going to support me? I'm, I can't support myself, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big, big deal. Big, big I deal. Actually, this is also going back to the relationship thing, because I think that most of, most of us relate to money the way that our parents relate to money. Totally. And it's a big, it's a, it's a radical and I think sometimes betrayal level change to do it differently we just moved into this new place you know i'm like you probably can tell but we haven't talked about it um september 15th so just a couple weeks ago and what we're paying in rent i i'm not i get, i could tell my parents but i i'm not inclined to like they would just freak them out they they can't even they just kind of have to close their eyes when it comes to me because it, they, it's so different from what they have spent their 60, 70 years of living doing. It's different from what their parents did. It's different from what those parents did. Like I have complete, I just took a hard right. <laughs> We're going <laughs> a completely different direction. And and you had to be willing to, not just intellectually willing to, but you had to be willing to in action. So in case people missed that, what, what Jesse was saying from the stage was you actually have to take action. You can't just talk about it. You can't just talk a good game. And money is such an interesting place where when push comes to shove, it shows you where you're willing or not willing to take action and, yep. and, and trust and have faith and go forward and say, I really do want to change. And, and, and people are afraid to talk about it because of all that codependent weirdness and the yeah. old belief structure. So, well, and and I mean, also because like I two two of my one-on-one -on -one clients who are both doing kick-ass 
told me yesterday, Jesse, I don't like you right now. Like, I kind of hate you right now. Yeah. And right, think back to me five years ago on a sales call with a complete stranger who said no to me, feeling crushed and rejected. I couldn't have handled that years ago. So I wouldn't have said what they needed to hear. Correct. The thing they said after they don't like me and they kind of hate me is that they're grateful. Right. Of course they are. I'm willing to say it, you know. And that's but what they're I, paying you the big bucks for too, right? But I got to be willing to let that, like, I, again, just like with you, I got to be willing to let them feel their feelings toward me and not be manipulating myself or contorting myself so that they have good feelings toward me. That's a hu huge cultural yeah. shift to Absolutely. be refusing, like opting out. That's why you and I are so special in the <laughs> world and, in our, and each other's relation. You know, it's like yeah. not many people are willing to go there. Absolutely. hundred percent. I want to add something to this, which is that like the, the, like the clients being angry is one mm. thing, right? Pissed off, angry. Okay. Tantrums even. Okay. Have you had someone had a tantrum? I've had people have tantrums and it's like, you have to hold space and you have to like be clear and, and be like, this is the lane. And you also have to not be available for certain things. Um, yeah, and yeah. when I, and when I say tantrums, I, I sometimes it's an expression of their emotions, but it's come, it, it always in, is an expression of their emotions, but it's coming from a, a, a very core child, um, wounded child space. And if, if I'm reactive to that, it doesn't, leave space for them to, to, to move through it, express it and, and step forward into the truth of who they are. Mm -hmm. it, it keeps it locked in place. But the flip side of this, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you've had this experience too, which is compliments. Mm -hmm. Someone, right? The flip side of, of like mm -hmm. being angry at you is laying on the compliments. Adoring, and, yeah. Yeah. And both, uh -huh. both sides are ways of um, unconsciously, mostly unconsciously, I, I would say, I give people the benefit of the doubt. They're um, manipulating someone else's behavior and, and neither is acceptable, right? Correct. Neither is taking personal responsibility. Neither is growing yourself. Neither is getting to that next level. Yeah. 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 I think it's why I actually, I, I really celebrate it now when my clients have difficult feelings and say them to me because it, it's hard to do. And they, you know, everyone's collective consciousness would kind of prefer, hi, honey. <laughs> That's the doggy. Everyone's, everyone's sort of superficial personal preference would be that we're all in love and feeling good all the time. But um, it's, it's so healing for people when they get to have their full range of feelings and not be punished or judged. Uh, yeah. Because of it. So I, and it opens up our range, like me and my clients range in the relationship to have the experience. Like, yeah, you get to feel whatever you want to feel and I'm not going to use it to do anything to myself. I'm not going to use it to punish me. I'm not going to use it to punish you. We're going to keep looking at it just like we always do. I, I think that's the, it is, it is in that way that I think that coaches are messengers of unconditional love and we're human. So we're not perfect, but we're like in that way, we have the opportunity to love people where they have never experienced love before. 100%. Not because we're being so positive and reassuring and loving and motherly, but just because we're refusing to participate in whatever hook is coming up is it, that's the most spiritual thing really that we can do. I couldn't another. agree more with you. That's absolutely it. And I think that that's what differentiates um, coaches. You know, there are coaches who are still scared of rejection and scared of what you're going to think of them. And they're going to agree with you. And mm. that's not going to allow you to get to the next level. And mm. quite frankly, that's unacceptable in my book. That's it. When I hire someone, I'm hiring them for their level of awareness and for the truth with which they, they speak to me. And mm. I'm not hiring someone who's at the same level of awareness as I am and hope I'm not hiring a friend. Okay. That's I'm right. not, I'm not hiring someone who really wants like that. I just want to like hang out with. I want to, I want to respect the person. I want to like the person to some degree at least, 
but I want them to bring a higher level of consciousness and that's going to cause me to grow. And Mm -hmm. they're going to say things now I get, now I'm really good at it. I don't know about you, but now when someone says something that's like a wake up call to me, it's like, I fall in love with that pretty damn Mm -hmm. immediately because I know now the pattern here that that, that wake up call, that's exactly what I needed to hear. I might have to cogitate on it or like figure out what it is, but but I know there's power in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. I love it. Okay. Before I ask you our last question, my last question, can you tell people where they can find you? At Jesse Johnson coaching is my handle on all the platforms. Jesse has no I J E S S E. Uh, YouTube and Instagram are our kind of favorite platforms, but we're everywhere. And, and jessiejohnson.com, jessiejohnsoncoaching.com. Jessiejohnson.com is like Prince's drummer, which I, or guitarist or something, which I feel like very blessed to share the name with him, but you have to add coaching on the end to find me. Okay. (laughs) Fantastic. Okay. Everyone run, don't walk. Uh, my final question is what makes you an unstoppable woman? Mm -hmm. Because you are one, of course. Mm Mm-hmm. At the, at the risk of repetition and also the benefit of repetition, I will say my, my relationship with God, my devotion, my, my understanding of where love is, is the thing that fuels me no matter what. Because there, there's other fuel sources, but they are more inconsistent in my life. And that one, my relationship with God is... is absolutely all the time, anytime available to me. That's where my vision comes from. That's where my knowing comes from. That's where my relaxation and ease come from. That's where my understanding of abundance comes from. And it's what makes me want to be unstoppable. I love that. I love that. Just a little quick story to wrap us up here. The first time I met Jesse was at a workshop seminar and There was a Mm -hmm. constant question of, I forget exactly what the question was, but it was sort of a check-in question, like, how are you feeling right now? It was Mm -hmm. three days of intense work. And um, she just kept saying, I am so grateful for my my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Like, and I was like, who is this woman? I need to know this woman. (laughs) (laughs) And then you told me I had a cute ass in the hallway and I was like, Oh, I really need to know her because she's <laughs> sassy too. <laughs> I don't yes. know if you slapped my ass or pitched my ass or something, but you no, were like, "Oh, did I really?" You did something. Maybe it was like your 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 ass looks really good in those jeans, and then you just walked by. Yes, that's exactly what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so she had it all. She had the spirituality mm-hmm. and she had the badass. So how can you not love that? Okay, my dearest friend. Thank you so much for being here. It has been so much fun and such an honor. And I love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. Mwah. Forever. I love Forever. you. I'm so grateful to be here with you. It's such an honor to walk together. Yes. Mwah. Bye. Bye. Okay. And that's a wrap. Hey, thanks so much for joining us and being part of the Unstoppable Woman movement. We have got a ton of free resources for scaling your business at theunstoppablewoman.com slash free stuff. And you can find that link in the description below. So go ahead and check those out. And we'd also love your help in getting our message out to more and more women. If you'd be willing to share this video with all the unstoppable women in your life, that would be fantastic. And while you're at it, hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Reviews, likes, and comments are greatly appreciated. We go in and read them all. So thank you for those. And thanks for listening and be unstoppable.